Okay, um, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this, um, your, this webinar on patient involvement in the ERN evaluation process. Um, my name is Ines uh, Hernando, and I am the, um, the ERN Healthcare Director at, at URDIS. Um, before we get started, I want to ask everyone um, to please enable um, in the top right corner of your screens, you'll see the view uh, menu. Enable the speaker um, view so that you can see who's speaking um, in, at, at um, the different um, moments in this webinar. So, um, well, first of all, I want to um, welcome the speakers that are with us today. So we have invited um, Paula Teruel from IDOM. So he, she, she works at, at the consultancy that is running the evaluation process. She's uh, the evaluation and, and, and coordinator manager there. We also uh, have with us uh, Michelle, Michelle Baillet, who is the ERN uh, European project manager. Most of you know her, I'm sure. Um, we have also uh, invited to speak today uh, to uh, Barbara Brumeyer. So Barbara is um, the patient representative manager at, at PetCan. And we have also with us today, Teresa Frank, who's uh, an EPEC advocate at ERN uh, Reconnect since the very beginning. And of course, uh, well, it's not there, but Matt uh, Bolsjonsson, who is uh, the ERN healthcare advisor at URDIS is also a speaker in this webinar and will be with us. So um, I guess that you all know, because you've been all very much involved, that, that um, we have been through um, the first phase of the evaluation process. So IDOM has been um, uh, organizing interviews. They've also done uh, some audits. Uh, but uh, you have also, uh, you, I'm, I'm, I'm referring to the ERNs and healthcare providers, have also done a lot of work uh, with uh, your own self-assessments. So um, this first stage is almost over and we wanted to take a little bit of time to stop and reflect uh, how this has been going and how patients have been involved in this uh, very first stage of the evaluation process. Um, you might be aware that the evaluation is a quite a complex exercise. It is covering um, ERNs, but also healthcare providers. It's looking at whether um, they are still fulfilling the EU legislation in terms of the operational criteria, but it's also looking at whether the ERNs have achieved their objectives. It's also looking at the performance and outcomes and at the deliverables from the operating grants. So it's quite a heavy exercise in, in, uh, in different ways. Um, so that's why we thought it was interesting to get the perspectives from uh, different uh, actors in, in, in this process. So without further ado, I think I'm going to uh, yeah, uh, hand over to our first speaker, who is uh, Paula. Paula, please. Hey, thank you, Ines. Um, so I am Paula Teruel, one of the evaluation coordinators from IDOM, um, and I'm going to talk about a little bit of the project for the independent evaluation of ERNs and HCPs. So can you please go to the next slide? Thank you. So just a little bit of background about the project. Um, the ERNs were created to ensure quality in rare disease patient treatments. And the first ERNs were created in March uh, 2017, involving more than 900 highly specialized ACPs from over 300 hospitals in 26 different EU countries. Nowadays, 24 ERNs are working on a wide range of thematic issues, including bone disorders, childhood cancer, and immune diseases, among many others, as you know. So the evaluation refers to the process of determining the significance of the work and actions developed by the networks and their members. To fully support the ACPs and ERNs, a quality improve, uh, improvement framework named AMEQUIS has been designed by the Avedis and Avedian Foundation. So AMEQUIS stands for Assessment, Monitoring, Evaluation and Quality Improvement System. And it is a dynamic learning system that aims to support all participants of the ERNs to continuously improve and develop. This ensures the best possible care for patients with rare or complex diseases. So 
The networks are required under the European uh, law to be evaluated on a regular basis and as a minimum before the end of the first five year contractual period. And the evaluation focuses on uh, four different topics that you can see here. The first one is to verify that the networks and the HCPs continue to fulfill the requirements outlined in the EU law. The second one is to determine the extent to which the networks have accomplished the initial objectives that were set out in their application. The third one is to assess the outcomes and performance of the networks as well as each ACP's contribution. And finally, the achievement of the objectives and quality of the deliverables produced in accordance with the network's grant from the European Commission. Next slide. Thank you. The evaluation of these ERNs is based on verifying to which extent both the ERNs and healthcare providers meet the quality requirements or criteria related to the achievements of the objective for which they were constituted. And with this goal, two different sets of operational criteria were created, one for the networks and the other one for the healthcare providers. So for the ERNs, as you can see in this table here, uh, the main the areas were governance and coordination, clinical care, quality and patient safety, patient centered care, contribution to research, education and training, and network and dissemination. Whereas for HCPs, they're a little bit different and they were involving patient care, organizational management, research, training and, edu and education, exchange of expertise, quality and safety, competence, and human resources. Uh, the technical evaluation is uh, slightly different in the case of the ERNs and HCPs, so there will be explained separately in the following slides. However, for a better understanding on how the evaluation works, in this slide there is a, an overview of the evaluation timeline in which the three key steps and the activities involved in each one of them are presented. So there are main, three main phases. The first one is the self-evaluation of the networks and healthcare providers. The second one is the uh, technical evaluation by the independent evaluation body, which involves the document, uh, document review, as well as some virtual interviews with ERNs and on-site audits in uh, some HCPs. And finally, the last phase consists on the elaboration of the final reports where conclusions and improvements are drawn from the centers that need them. And uh, regarding this evaluation, there are two possible results uh, for both the ERNs and HCPs. They can either get a satisfactory result or an its improvement result that will be accompanied by an improvement plan. Um, so starting with the technical evaluation of the networks, its objectives uh, is to review the different uh, resources uh, of information provided by the ERNs to check the compliance of the operational criteria and the accomplishment of the network's objectives over the past five years. During the document review, um, there's different documents that have been reviewed. <laughs> and this is the information and evidence included in the self-evaluation, the grant reports, the network's assessment application, and the network's monitoring indicators. The evaluators also determined what information needed to be completed or contrasted during the virtual interviews, which was the second phase of the evaluation. So the main objective of the virtual interviews uh, is to complete the information in the documents that the ERN provided to properly evaluate the work developed by the network during the five years. So there are two different online interviews. First, an interview with the network and work packages coordinators to discuss these achievements of the ERNs and any other areas that require further clarification after the document review. And then a separate interview uh, was conducted with the patient representatives to contrast the, uh, with the patient representatives their level of participation in the different actions of the networks and to validate their involvement in the strategic, uh, operational and technical activities. So the next slide, please. Thank you. So for these interviews, um, the objective, as I already mentioned, is to gather the opinion of the patient representatives on the network's achievements and the progress of their participation within the network. Um, a number between four and six patient representatives from each ERN were randomly selected from a list provided by the ERN. 
And the main elements to evaluate during these interviews were the structure of the patient involvement in the network, the impact on, of patient involvement in the strategic discussion and operational activities, um, the main barriers and enablers for meaningful patient involvement, and the reflections regarding the whole ERN system, in particular the extent um, the network has accomplished the objectives and achievements of, of the network. Moving forward to the technical evaluation of the healthcare providers, the objectives um, is to review the different sources of information provided by the HCPs, and in some cases conduct an audit, all of this to ensure their contribution to the mission of each network, as well as the adjustment of the um, care process to the required quality levels. So there was also a document review for HCPs, which involved the review of the self-evaluation information, the HCPs initial assessment application, and the monitoring indicators as well. And as I have uh, just mentioned, um, some HCPs were also randomly selected for on-site audit. Uh, out of the 840 HCPs that are being evaluated right now, 193, are, were randomly selected for the on-site audits that are currently being conducted. So the main objective of these on-site audits is to obtain information on those criteria that cannot be directly assessed from the self-evaluation and the documentary review. And these on-site audits have uh, three different parts. The first one is the medical records review, then there's a professional review and a patient's interview. So for the last, uh, this last interview, the patient's interview, a number between six and eight patient representatives are being asked to, to participate in its ACPs um, to evaluate their general satisfaction with the ACP. And I think it's also worth mentioning here uh, in this webinar that there are some specific questions as well um, regarding the information rate they receive from the ACP regarding the local and national patient uh, organizations. Uh, regarding their disease. So I think that's really interesting to, to gather this information. And uh, what well, this is all from, from my side. Um, it's not an easy project. As you can see, there are so many ECPs involved and, and a lot of people. Um, but I hope you were able to get a general picture of the project and understand a little bit the involvement of the patient organization and patient representatives in this project. And uh, well, I would also like to thank you, Eurordis, for helping us in the development of the methodology for the patient representatives interview. And if there's some IPAC here that IPAC representative here that participated in any of the interviews, then I would also like to express our gratitude and to let you know that uh, your insight and participation has been really, really helpful in this project. So thank you. Thank you, Paula. Um, we, we, we'll we have a, a panel discussion after the presentation, so if there's any questions you want to raise, put them in the chat and we'll catch them, Lenya is monitoring the chat. Um, I think we've heard uh, from Paula around how the evaluation process is really being quite patient-centred. Um, I wanted just to give an update on how your audits have been supporting the patient representatives to be involved in that process. Um, I've got an echo on my thing, on my um, uh, head foot set. Um, so I wanted just to explain how your audits have supported the patient representatives involved in the interview process and to ensure that we, we maximize this opportunity of the evaluation to move the networks from being good to great. Um, Paolo mentioned about the, uh, uh, the assessment monitoring and uh, evaluation quality improvement system, which is Amicus, and how the evaluation is part of that bigger system. Um, we've had a working group, a task force, active over the last 12 months. These are the people who are involved in the task force, and they've been representing the different ERNs, we've, uh, I think we've got 19 ERNs covered at the moment. Um, and so when that evaluation or the Amicus framework was being set up, the, these group of uh, patient representatives were active in uh, contributing to the development of that, uh, that quality improvement system and specifically the evaluation. Um, you can see here over the past year, 
that we had lots of work workshops um, with the task force, uh, actually eight in total. And we did some webinars on the Amicris system and we produced uh, some tools for patient representatives to use. We also were from, I think it was end of November through to end of February, we supported and had calls with each of the EPAG groups directly to explain this process in more detail um, and to and warm up the discussion ahead of the interviews which took place in March. Um, so we still got some activities we're doing this year because uh, this task force is really important to monitor how the evaluation process develops and what the output of the evaluation process is and to be best positioned to advocate um, uh, where we need to to make sure that the that this process is something which is of value and can really support the networks improve. I mentioned that the task force of last year um, uh, contributed to the development of the Amicris framework. We did uh, three uh, advocacy statements, which you can see here, and we did a very detailed one on the on the evaluation process, which is actually this one. Um, and uh, one of the things which we'll do at the end of this year is uh, advocate on the outcome of the evaluation process, but also uh, give our feedback on what worked well in the first evaluation, what could be improved. So to give that feedback uh, to the commission as well, so we can um, continue to get a, a, a more refined evaluation system. Uh, Paula mentioned about the uh, virtual interviews which took place. Um, IDOM had been very engaging with Eurodis. They spoke to us about the methodology for uh, the interviews of patient representatives in the network, which you heard a minute ago. Um, and actually our contribution was that they, they listened to us. There was a couple of areas which uh, the, the position which was being proposed changed. Um, and we're very grateful that they were they listened to what our, what we what we were uh, advocating for. Um, one important aspect of that was that the patient interviews originally were just going to be focused on patient representatives from the EU. Um, and actually that changed because there's no law to uh, exclude patient representatives taking part in the networks outside the EU. So, so that was a really helpful uh, change. Um, we've already heard about the, what the interviews, to, uh, how the interviews uh, were focused and what they covered. Um, but one of the things around the selection criteria of patient representatives, we, we also uh, got uh, included that it was a, a, a mix of patient representatives, uh, tried to identify patient representatives who are in the executive groups of the network, you know, that who have a leadership or coordination position. They could be a chair of one of the EPAC groups or a patient council and sit on the network board. Um, but also to try and ensure that we have people who've been, be, who were interviewed, who've been here in the involved in the networks for a longer period. Maybe the ones who were who were who joined the network at the beginning in the application, or the first couple of years. So that sense of time and seeing how the networks have developed over a five-year period, they could contribute to that. But we also didn't want to exclude people who were new uh, patient representatives in the networks because sometimes that fresh pair of eyes is really valuable, but it's important that any of the patient representatives interviewed were, were ones which had been active and had, had have got something to contribute about. Um, so, so that was taken on board as well. Eurodis developed a, a guide. So Paola just presented the evaluation uh, uh, process. Um, there is a manual for evaluation, which is about 200 pages long. I can share the link to that if anyone's really interested. Um, it's a thrilling read. Uh, I often go to it when I'm going to bed just to rub up on my evaluation and, and uh, uh, methodology. Um, but we did a, a summary of that. It was a 10-page summary. And we also did a two-page summary, which uh, was a are frequently asked questions, why are they being evaluated? What's the focus? 
who will be evaluated, when it will it take place, how will it take, how will patients be involved? So it was quite a simple um, uh, uh, tool. So we've heard about the methodology for the evaluation process, and we've talked about how Eurodis have supported the patient representatives in the ERNs to take part and have a meaningful role. Um, we've got three sort of vignettes, three experiences from uh, project managers in the network, from EPAC representatives in the network, and from um, a, a project manager active in the network who's employed directly from one of the patient organizations. So it's to try and put some color on this process and to show, has it been useful? Is it been completely bureaucratic? Uh, what's worked, what hasn't? So, so we first of all got Michelle to talk about her experiences in uh, Euro, Eurogen. So I'll hand over to Michelle. Uh, yes, hello everyone, and thank you very much uh, for inviting me, uh, Eurodis. Um, I'm essentially I'm going to share with you our experiences um, and and mine uh, from the coordination team of one of the 24 ERNs. So the ERN I manage um, is called Eurogen, which deals with rare urogenital diseases and complex conditions. So it's divided into three work streams and work, the first work stream is congenital rare, Euro, rare urogenital conditions um, and anomalies. Um, so they're largely occurring in children. On the second work stream is complex conditions. So it's functional urogenital conditions that need highly specialized surgery. And then the third work stream is rare urogenital tumours. And our network is all highly specialised surgery focused. Um, so whether children or adults, they're all going to need uh, the, a highly specialised surgeon to treat them. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so that's a little bit more about our work streams and all the disease areas that we cover. And we also collaborate very actively with many of the other ERNs because there are slight crossovers um, between the various disease areas. And I think that's a really fruitful collaboration. Next slide, please. And this is just a quick slide to show you uh, where the healthcare providers within our network are based. Uh, we now have 57 healthcare providers uh, in 20 member states, and we're actually one of, one of the smaller ERNs, I should say, as well. Um, but that's how we're structured and, and that, that's how we're organised. Next slide, please. So I was asked to give you uh, some of the perspectives of the coordination team on the evaluation process. Um, and looking back uh, to the amicus process that Matt mentioned, um, we've all been very, very well aware that this was coming. Uh, it was in the legislation and we all know that we're going to be evaluated every five years. And I think there was a really good level of stakeholder engagement with the Amaquis Consortium. Um, the meetings were very well organised and uh, as Matt mentioned, we were able to give input into the process. So I think that was very positive. Um, on the whole, the evaluation help desk responded very quickly to the various queries that we had. And Matt also mentioned the evaluation manuals. Indeed, they were extremely comprehensive uh, and quite long, I should say. Um, and we found uh, that actually this was too much information and it was too detailed for our healthcare providers who were generally busy surgeons in hospitals. Um, they weren't able to look at a document of that length. So what a lot of the ERN coordination teams did, um, just as your audits did for the patient representatives, is try to condense that material down into something that was more easily digestible uh, by the clinicians in the hospitals. Um, and we, uh, many of us also did webinars on the evaluation so that we could try and explain uh, to our clinicians what, what was going to be involved. Um, some areas for improvement I could touch on. Um, the process was a little bit delayed. It was supposed to start on the 1st of September and that was delayed. 
and uh, just uh, this is just relative to our ERN, um, but there was some issues with the accuracy of the information um, around one healthcare provider was missing and the contact information for many of them, uh, well, a couple of them was, was uh, not correct, so they weren't always receiving the messages. So it took a little bit of time to work through that. Um, we also had uh, a few delays in answering uh, clarification questions from the ERNs. Now, everything was also managed through an IT portal, which, uh, as you can understand, with an exercise of this size and scale um, is needed. Um, but again, uh, feedback from our healthcare providers was that this was a bit of a burden for them because they had to keep logging on into the portal and checking there for any messages. Um, so one thing that we would recommend is if something very important is happening, like one of the reports is being released or, or they need an urgent message for the healthcare provider, we recommend that email is also used um, because there's absolutely no guarantee that a busy surgeon is going to be logging onto the portal on a regular basis. And actually, one of the things that we did quite a lot in the coordination team was kept a very close eye on the portal and we were emailing our healthcare providers where we needed to. Next slide, please. So it, in terms of over the overall value of the evaluation process, well, um, I, we, we think there was enormous value in it. For us as a coordination team, it, it really stimulated uh, some internal reflections and focused the minds back on what we were really set up here to do. Um, and how far have we got towards achieving that? Um, so I think that was really interesting. We had a lot of interesting discussions about it in the coordination team. And I think it was also useful because um, without a doubt, it focused the minds of some of the healthcare providers um, on the array of different tasks and activities that they were required to do to be a mem an active member of the ERN. So when they were completing the evaluation, they could see if there were gaps. They weren't able to um, add information if they hadn't done anything. So for them, again, I think in terms of reflection over how active they've been over the five year period, I think it was very useful for them. So we hope that it will stimulate further activity and more engagement with the healthcare providers going forward. Um, and also for us as a coordination team, it highlighted some particular issues with some healthcare providers in certain areas. And we have a performance management system in our ERN where we are tracking um, the various activities of each healthcare provider, whether they're collaborating in terms of the registry, training and education activities, are they working on guidelines, are they returning their annual uh, patient numbers and surgical procedure numbers. So because we have that very active tracking uh, performance management system, um, we're able to discuss it with them on a monthly basis. And in fact, uh, we also have, um, as part of the governance of our ERN, we have a termination process, a protocol for the healthcare providers in our network. And this is a step up process um, over time. So first we would engage with a particular hospital in terms of having a meeting, trying to understand where the barriers or problems are, whether we can direct more resources to help them. But ultimately, if a healthcare provider is inactive over a long period of time, then we can remove them from the network. So I think there are also lessons to be learned on how we improve network performance management and really tighten up our governance policies going forward. Next slide, please. So how are our patient representatives involved? Um, uh, hopefully very actively. So uh, we have a very, just to give you a flavor of the context, because we're dealing with rare urogenital diseases, the, the main issues for our patients with the disease areas we cover are things like urinary and fetal incontinence and sexual dysfunction. And we know they need a lot of psychological support. So the pool, the number of our patient representatives is much smaller for us 
than it is for some other ERNs, like, I don't know, paediatric cancer, for example, because we have a much smaller number of, of courageous patients who are willing to talk about this kind of thing. And also, um, there are far, far less formal patient organisations in our area. So we do um, have issues with that, I would say. However, having said that, we've got um, a small number of incredibly committed and active patient representatives who we, we are incredibly grateful for. Um, they were involved in all of the amicus stakeholder consultations with the coordination team, and they helped us draft various responses to that. Um, the evaluation has been regularly discussed at network meetings, and that's with the clinicians and with our patient representatives. So I think there was a relatively high awareness of this amongst the whole network um, for, for many years, I think I would say. Um, one other thing that we did, and this was good for everybody to do, I think, is we, we went back to our original grant application, which was written in 2016, with the patient representative that was in post then they co-drafted it with us um, and we highlighted the fact that um, we were aiming to achieve six out of the eight objectives that were in the directive we also had preparatory meetings for the evaluation in uh, interviews between the epag and the coordination team and we sent the EPAG representatives all the various guidance documents and, and use those as a basis for the discussion. And um, I don't want to leave out your audits because they performed an extremely helpful support function. They uh, sent all the ERNs uh, some supporting evidence, uh, for example, around the measurable element on patient engagement. Um, and some ERNs were involved in um, a pilot project to develop a, a patient reported experience measure um, for rare diseases. And again, we received some useful documentation to support the fact that we were engaged in that. Um, so that was all very helpful, I think. Next slide, please. So the independent evaluation body interviews. Uh, so I participated in the one with the coordination team. Um, we didn't invite our EPAG to that because we uh, followed the guidance in the evaluation manual and toolbox. Um, I would say, if I had a, a recommendation, I would say I would have the interview for a bit more than an hour. I think an hour is, is, is quite short for the sort of extensive discussions that you could go into over the whole of the various measurable elements. Uh, so I, I would possibly expect a little bit more time for that. I thought the interviews were well prepared and they focused on the core measurable elements. And, um, you know, they've definitely done their homework because uh, one question they asked us is why we had a low output in one of our areas, which was clinical guidelines. Um, and we were able to explain that we didn't start any work. We didn't have any deliverables in our grant because uh, the network board didn't want to start working on guidelines until the ERN methodology was available. And that happened in 2021. So hopefully we had a good explanation for that. And actually going forward, I think now um, guidelines will become a priority focus of our work because we can really get stuck into them in earnest now. Next slide, please. Um, so what did we do to prepare the patient representatives for the interview? Well, again, we had this uh, function in the coordination team, not myself, a colleague of mine was uh, kind of on high alert on the portal. He was monitoring all aspects of uh, messages uh, related to our ERN and sending them to whoever needed them. So he did that for the EPAGs very kindly. Um, and we asked our chair of the EPAG to invite the other EPAGs to the meeting, which they did. Um, we shared all the documents with them and we also shared with them our network evaluation that we'd already completed so that they could see what we, uh, how we'd evaluated ourselves. And then of course they were completely free to comment on it, whether they agreed or whether they uh, had comments to make. Um, 
Yes, so uh, we had a little bit slight confusion with uh, who to invite to the EPAG uh, interview because we only had one EPAG representative who's still in post since the very beginning, since 2017, and we've had some changes and additions since then. Um, so the other EPAG representatives that participated in the interview, some of them were quite new. So, of course, they wouldn't have that historical um, time frame of being involved since the very beginning, but at least uh, there was someone there that did. Next slide, please. So in terms of uh, key messages, um, well, what it really demonstrated for us is the, the it really underlined the importance of the healthcare providers support and the level of their internal coordination. So what do I mean by that? Well, Red, Radboud University Medical Center, which is the place where I work, is uh, coordinating two ERNs, mine and another, Gentoris, and it's a member of 18. So they uh, put uh, someone in the hospital in charge of gathering all the documents and all the evidence related to the general criteria, and they were all saved in a common folder that all the different uh, specialized teams could access when they were answering the evaluation. So that was incredibly helpful and saved many people a lot of work. Um, and that makes it much easier to deal with this kind of evaluation process. Now, if you're a specialized team in a hospital, you're a member of one ERN for one disease area only, you would have to do all of that yourself. And generally the feedback coming from them was, they didn't have this level of hospital support. So that may, meant their workload increased massively. And I think that's a, a, an extremely important learning point for the next evaluation process. So something needs to be done to help uh, those small one team, one disease area in one hospital uh, colleagues. Uh, it stimulated a huge amount of reflection uh, and we hope that uh, that will continue and that we can really tackle uh, improvements going forward. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for listening to me and I look forward to the panel discussion. Thank you, Michelle. That was really interesting. I, I've wrote down a couple of questions, which I'll also uh, I'll pause and come back to you when we... Uh, um uh, have the panel discussion uh but uh, around the original uh, grant application what you would change now going back to it but we'll come back to that later so please put your questions in the chat and we can come back to michelle um, in a bit i'd like to move on to barbara to give the experiences uh from uh cci and how they have experienced uh the evaluation process and so far Hello, everybody, and thank you for inviting me to this uh, very, very interesting webinar. It was really very interesting for me to listen to the talk of Michelle, and I found very many similarities, uh, which I will show you in my presentation. Next slide, please. Uh, so briefly, I would like to introduce uh, our organization. We are Childhood in Cancer International Europe, and we work in the Earn PetCan, so the European Reference Network Network for Pediatric Cancer. And our board consists of two members, Anita Kinesberger and Luisa Bassett, as you see here, and the several other EPACs, which are Anne, Leila, Harun, and um, Karina. And I am um, a project manager um, that is hired by Childhood Cancer International and is part of my responsibilities are to directly support uh, Childhood Cancer International Europe in the earn pet can matters. Next slide, please. So what are we? <clears throat> we are kind of an umbrella organization for all uh, pediatric cancer, childhood cancer, sorry, for all childhood cancer 
uh, patient organizations throughout Europe, uh, within the EU, but also outside of the EU, with the mission to unite, unite uh, people to improve the medical and psychosocial care for children and adolescents in cancer all over Europe. We also want to implement European standards of care to eliminate our most pressing issue, which is a survival inequality qualities uh, in the different countries. And last not least, it is also very important for us to improve the quality of the survivorship. In this, uh, we consist now of 63 European member organizations from 34 different countries. And um, we are part of a global network, which is Childhood Cancer International. Next slide, please. Just briefly, let me sum up the governance structure of Earn Petken. So in the middle, you see the network management team, and that is basically the core. It's the team from the coordinator who are connecting all the different um, um, uh, parts of this network. Um, and on top of it, there is the oversight committee and uh, as you can see, Childhood Cancer International Europe has chairs in this oversight committee uh, to make sure that patients are involved also in the governance of this urn. Um, quite importantly, on the right side, you see uh, the SIOP office. So SIOP is the uh, European Society for Pediatric Oncology um, that is kind of the healthcare provider organization similar to our patient organization and uh, this is also a, a structure that, said, that has existed uh, long before and uh, the umbrella organization of this is also um, a global uh, network where all pediatric cancer um, healthcare providers are united. And um, on the bottom of all these are all Earn Petken members and of course the European Commission is also involved. And we have an ethics advisory committee also who makes sure that everything goes as it should. Next slide please. So what is our role in the Earn Petken governance? Uh, as I already mentioned before, there are the two chairs from our organization in the oversight committee, which is actually the highest decision level uh, making level of the network. And so we can check the, uh, that quality is assured and we can also check on the network's performance. Um, recently, our organization has received its own work package, including a small budget, which, uh, which, which, with which we can work uh, now. And the aim of this work package is the even better integration of patient representatives in Earn Petken. We are also doing training and education activities, for example, webinars specifically focused on that for all our members. And we are reviewing the European standard of care practice guidelines that are developed for the specific uh, cancer types in our network. Next slide, please. So coming to the evaluation process. Um, we were invited into the interview with the coordinator since CCI Europe is uh, a chair in the oversight committee. So we were able to listen in and we could also give our opinion if we wanted to. And I was also there as a patient representative uh, manager. Next slide. Um, Concerning the interview preparations for the patient interview, we were a little bit uncertain at the beginning how this would go, how the exact procedure would be, who would be there, which questions are going to be asked. And um, so we together, we initiated a very intensive uh, preparatory cooperation with the project managers from the coordinator. 
And uh, the coordinator sent us many supportive documents, uh, everything that we asked for. Um, we uh, were helped out with the evaluation survey for certain questions where we were unsure, so which box should we tick? Are we really there or not? It was not always totally clear. And we also had a preparatory meeting with all patient representatives that have been invited to the patient interview. And last but not least, um, also as Michelle already mentioned, uh, Eurority's support was a very much appreciated help and uh, they could um, give us a lot of information that was not totally clear and also the summary, uh, giving this summary was very, very helpful for us as well. Next slide, please. So um, um, we had the following experience. Um, the coordinators from our network had to hand over um, a list of uh, our members, which were, as I already said before, uh, 64 member organizations, and they could choose randomly from this uh, large pool of people. Um, which uh, gave us a little bit of a concern because um, as in every network, there are certain members that are more active, others are less active. Some members are good, well-informed, others are not so well-informed. And we were uh, asking ourselves, so what would happen if we have people in the interview who are not very uh, interested in the urn or do not know the urn by heart and uh, what would they say, would they even be willing to participate and so on. Um, but in the end, uh, sorry for the background noise, in the end it turned out uh, quite well because we had a very, very interesting mix of, of kind of people who were not so very much informed, but who were very interested to participate in the interview anyways. And uh, we also had EPACs that are very familiar with the network and its content. So we could really, I think we could give uh, several different viewpoints from the national patient representatives in our network in the interview and also what they expected from our urn and what would be helpful for us to have in the future. Next slide. I had very interesting impressions from the coordinators interview. So my feeling was that the evaluation process was deemed valuable and necessary, of course, and that it was an excellent opportunity to introduce the network uh, to the evaluators to show its benefits, but also to show its challenges. In our case, in our community, so this 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 big community was brought to life long, long time ago, based on the urgent need to save the lives of children with cancer. So our people are very, very driven to bring forward good results. So the network has basically already been there before urns were even brought into life. And our challenge is in part to adapt already existing structures to the tools that are offered for the urns or the other way around to bring our people to use new tools instead of older ones that they are more used to. Next slide, please. And there is always a however, <clears throat> As Michelle already mentioned a little bit before, um, especially the coordinator project managers uh, described the evaluation effort as really huge, uh, also for the individual healthcare providers. So it was quite a burden for the project managers and for all participants to submit the documents in the desired form. And they also mentioned that this has to be done in the spare time uh, for the healthcare providers who are, as we all know, extremely busy. <clears throat> and they hope that the next evaluation will be a little bit less onerous than this one, probably. Next slide. Uh, what I found also extremely interesting was that they, the 
earn coordinators not only from our network but it seems also from other networks uh, came uh, together and decided to set an example so they um, agreed to indicate zero in the evaluation form for two questions, which was how many publications per urn and how many clinical trials per urn. I mean, of course, our network and for sure all the others publish a high number of publica publications in high ranking journals every year. And in particular, in urn pet can almost every child with cancer is treated within the clinical trial. However, it is not financed by urn, uh, which, but by other sources, which is why they indicated zero. And they use this evaluation uh, as an opportunity to bring forward this joint statement. I found this quite strong. Next slide. So the key learnings for us was that, yes, our network still presents many challenges, both for patient advocates and for the healthcare providers. Some processes still do not run as fast and as smoothly as we all desire. But this evaluation helped us to remember also what we have already accomplished and how to find ways to implement what we want to accomplish together in the future. And of course, with a continuous and hopefully also increased support of the European Commission. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. Um, so I, there was a lot of, uh, I'm going to start my video. Thank you, Barbara. We, um, there was lots of uh, alignment, actually, with the feedback from Michelle about the heavy burden on the HCPs and, um, uh, and, and the value being a point of reflection in the network. Um, I think maybe we come back to some questions about that in the panel discussion after Charissa. Um, but thank you very much for sharing your experiences of the evaluation process and um, it was great to collaborate with CZI in the process, so very, very much grateful for your support here. So if we can get Charity, are you still there or have you been sucked back into the conference? I'm still here. <laughs> Super. Okay, I hand over to you. Thank you, Matt. Good afternoon. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank your orders. Uh, and uh, Matt Bolt-Johnson uh, Bolt to invite me today and give me the opportunity to represent my EPAC group, uh, ERN Reconet. Next slide, please. Before I go on, uh, I, I reside in Belgium. Uh, I'm the president of, of Bentwezel.be, and uh, I, uh, I am a Bentwezel.be is an umbrella organization for heritable connective tissue disorders. Besides being a patient advocate for ERN Reconnect, I wear many other, other hats. To help integrate the ERN Reconnect diseases in the Belgian health system, I am, voluntarily, the secretary of the Flemish Network of Rare Disease Connected Tissue Musculoskeletal and a patient expert in EMA. I hold various other national and international disease health patient related positions, but I'm not going to bore you with those positions. Next slide, please. This is one photo is taken at the last board meeting pre-COVID of the of the ERN of the European Reference Network of Connective Tissue Diseases and Musculoskeletal Diseases. The, it's a uh, connective tissue and musculoskeletal diseases for rare and low prevalence and complex diseases. Uh, actually, as Matt told you before, we are at the moment at a, a ERN Reconnect conference, Congress. You can see I'm in a hotel room right now. And we are actually starting our next board meeting uh, tomorrow, and, uh, or actually Sunday and Monday following this Congress. Next slide, please. Now I'm going to talk to you about some figures about uh, our ERN. Uh, after the last call, our ERN grew somewhat, uh, a little bit. We are, at the moment, we are in 23 member states. In the 23 member states, we have 15 uh, full uh, mem 
member states with full members and eight member states with affiliated partners. We have 64 uh, healthcare providers from which we have 55 full members and nine affiliated partners. We have 10 rare or low preference complex connected tissue disease groups. Next slide, please. Here you can see uh, a picture of the European uh, map. And you can see the green, dark green represents the countries where we are full members. And some of those may also have some affiliated members. In, uh, and the green, light green are only where we have affiliate members. Next slide, please. And here's an, a, a breakdown, breakdown per country. You can see Italy, where our ERN is based, we have 24 members. That's a lot of mem full members. But then if you look at Latvia, that's one of our newest uh, just after the uh, last call, uh, we only have two affiliated members. And in Belgium, the country where I, I am from, we have three full members. So it, it is very diverse all over Europe. Next slide, please. These are the 10 different disease, rare disease or uh, low prevalence uh, diseases. Not all our diseases, what do we mean with that? Not all of our diseases are rare, but they are so complex that they are have been taken up in the ERNs. Uh, one example of that is the systemic lupus erythematosus. And I'm not going to read them, but you can look at these and you see all the different diseases that we have. And next slide, please. I can honestly say that I was not the person who thought of this slide title. The reconnect coordination team made this slide and calls our EPEC the driving force of ERN reconnect. It is an honor that the Reconnect team considers us as the driving force. It helps empower the EPEC. Our EPEC consists of two patient advocates per disease area. In the last six years, six advocates joined our EPEC. Uh, they are Olga and Silke in the IIM, in the top right. And that's a, a fairly a pretty rare disease and we had a lot of problems. Um, and Magdalena, Camellia, and uh, those that have, have joined us. Uh, as you can see, um, Ilaria Galetti and myself, Ilaria is, is she, she, she in the middle on the right hand side. Uh, she is uh, systemic sclerosis or scleroderma. And I represent Ellis Danlos diseases. I'm in the top in the middle. We have been with ERN since the beginning, since Vilnius, we always say, and um, of the kickoff. And we are also as well steering committee members. I'm gonna also introduce you to the other steering committee members, as you can see the, the pictures right now. On the right hand bottom, uh, Anna, She's also a steering committee member. She joined our ERN about a year after Vilnius, after after the kickoff. And uh, later, uh, uh, Jeanette uh, also became a steering committee member. Our EPEC is uh, led by Ilaria Galetti, who I mentioned before, and is assisted by Sylvia Aguilera on the top left. You also see that we have some diseases, IgG4, U, uh, U, uh, UCTD, um, they, we don't have any EPEC advocates for those diseases because we cannot find anybody at the moment because they are rare or due to unfortunate uh, circumstances, we do not have any uh, advocates for those positions. Next slide, please. Uh, in the first years of our ERN, we had a different governance. It 
helped the, the old governments helped to to set up the the network because none of our diseases had had a or most of our diseases did not have an existing network when uh, we started working we we felt that we had to create a new gov or steering committee felt that we had to create a new governance to improve the the working of the of the network so we we decided that it would be better to have a them uh, thematic uh, to have uh, the a thematic group of five work groups the education and training registries and e-health patient partnerships research quality and care and ERN young these uh, net, uh, these groups are the, to, uh, they handle the design of transfer activities, templates, and formats, and they uh, give then oversee the implementation, and they give these to the implementation into the different disease areas, which then uh, are the ten different disease uh, groups, and the, in the different disease groups. Next slides, please. There are two. Uh, are overseen with two different um, disease coordinators. So here I can I can give you a little bit it's more explanation. Our network coordination is uh, Professor Marta Mosca. In the steering committee, we have uh, exist from founding members. When we first started out, uh, we had founding members and three patient representatives. Uh, in the steering committee. But with the new governments, we asked uh, if we could have, on the, because the network group, if we could have one additional patient advocate and one backup. And the steering committee agreed to that. As well as more countries joined or more member states could join, we also had four uh, newly elected healthcare providers uh, joined. And this was all done very democratically. The healthcare providers had a had a uh, vote, voted for that, and the EPAC uh, also separately uh, voted for the additional uh, EPAC uh, for the steering committee and for the backup. We also have a board of network year, yearly, and in the board of network, we have each uh, center has one H, has one vote. Uh, at the board of network. However, each EPAC has also a vote. The core EPAC, we only have two, two or up to uh, EPACs per disease area. We do work with uh, affiliate, what we call associates. Uh, associate, uh, we work with uh, the wider community. But when we work with the wider community, we do that when with projects and such. Next slide, please. We are mostly active in, with clinical practice guidelines and clinical decision-making tools, education, training, research, registries, and e-health and transversal activities. Next slide, please. So at the moment, we have four patient advocates in the steering committee. And also in each disease work group, the four patient advocates are co-chairs. So it's not only the two um, disease coordinators per work group, we are also the two patient advocates help steer the disease work groups. You, earlier you saw that at the five uh, thematic work groups, we are also very proud that we have three patient advocates who co-chair those work groups. The work group on patient partnerships supports and manages together the Reconnect coordination. Together with the Reconnect coordination team, it is a very important work group because it oversees all the activities of the ERN Reconnect and it, it is very strongly related to the empowerment and the involvement. And as I said to you earlier, we give our feedback to the wider uh, patient community and through affiliated partners. 
through projects. Uh, we also involve them with surveys and uh, that's how we get involved. So we are very involved with, with, with other uh, patient advocates as well, but on an other level. Next slide, please. The, the, during the ERN uh, process, the initial co communication was to the full members and steering committee in 2022. This process was mostly done by email and uh, with an invitation through webinars. The new full members and affiliated members, as well as EPAC advocates, they were able to follow the whole process on Basecamp. Basecamp is a software uh, platform that you can download on your cell phone, but you can also uh, use it on your laptop or PC. And here I made a, a screenshot and I uh, opened up a, a part of it. And you can see that they, you could, there, were, there are maps there where uh, the, the other people who were not, uh, did not receive this information, they could it was so transparent, they could see everything, the, uh, the evaluation documents that the full members and the steering committee uh, received. Uh, I received all this as well. Uh, the ERN reconnect uh, documents that they, uh, that they sent in support or that the, the coordinating team had uh, everything that the coordinating team uh, filled in or answered to the IEB. Uh, was we could all find and, and read. And also uh, the webinars uh, that were done on the ERN evaluation were all recorded and could all be uh, viewed. So either the link or the video was posted on this platform. Next slide, please. Then uh, for the evalu evaluation interviews, uh, the coordinator Marta Mosca and the coordination team had decided that uh, for the ERN uh, coordination uh, evaluation uh, interview that they would invite the steering committee, uh, for three uh, healthcare providers and two patient advocates from the steering committee to participate in the evaluation. Uh, Ilaria Galetti and myself were invited to participate. The rest of the steering committee received full process of the evaluation and documentation, and the other ERN were able to uh, follow the process through the documentation as provided in, on Basecamp. During the interview, we were able to give feedback from both steering committee and patient perspective. We were able to participate as an equal member of st as the steering committee, and uh, that being said, uh, I am a full member of the steering committee, and I'm not just there just to sit pretty and, and, and just sit there. Uh, I don't know if uh, you might not know me or know Ilaria, but we are both very verbal uh, people, uh, or women, I should say, and we, we always say how things are, and we are truly represent the patient's community. And we try to uh, do, we take our job very seriously. And we will voice our concerns, but say the good things, but also uh, give critical uh, uh, suggestions to help improve things. And our, uh, the, they listen to us. And also during this uh, evaluation interview, we have actually brought up points that were taken into uh, perspective. And actually, when we finished this interview, that uh, the interview was actually back to back to the EPAC uh, advocacy uh, interview, the, that the uh, IEB evaluators actually wanted us to continue our our discussion discussion to go on uh, what, what we talked about. Next slide, please. Teresa, this is Ines. Um, I'm just conscious of the time. Could you, uh, I don't know how many slides you have left, but do you think you can about, start wrapping up? 
so that yeah, we can this, this is about my last okay. almost my last one um uh, the 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 epac interviews in january uh where the received the documentation that the IEP evaluation sent with most frequently asked uh, evaluations, they received official uh, documentation for interviews and they received the, uh, also the emails. Then uh, the three persons who were, were longest uh, were Anna, Ilaria, and myself. Uh, we were put forward. The whole EPAC agreed to this, and then the IEB chose three other EPAC associates as well. Then, after the uh, ERN uh, coordination team, uh, we locked off, and then uh, Ilaria and myself joined the new uh, evaluation, and we actually uh, continued the discussion. And it was actually a very, very good critical uh, discussion and it was very transparent as well. So the whole, pro the whole process was very uh, transparent. Next slide, please. Uh, I just want to give a last, uh, last takeaway message. Uh, I found this on the internet that it's an unknown author. If we do not engage consumers, patients, and family members in healthcare processes, we will not be effective at eliminating in inequalities and improving health for all. And thank you for listening. Thank you, Charissa. Just start my video. Um, so we've got uh, questions and answers now. Um, uh, I can see there's a question in the chat, but uh, please raise your hand and you can ask a question to uh, Barbara, Charissa, um, or to Paula and Michelle. Um, so please feel free to un unmute your mics while while people are doing that i have a couple of questions hopefully they're really difficult questions for you which can tax you is is, is paula still available i can't see her yes yes okay so i'm going to start off with you um uh, in terms of the evaluation manual which was developed last year when you were given it, because you didn't develop it, was was it complete or was there gaps in some of the methodology which you had to fill in? Well, um, it was mostly complete, but there was a main gap that we um, identified that it was the patient representatives interview. So um, it was uh, for the evaluation of the year ends, there was the documentary review and the interview with the network coordinators, but there was not in the methodology the patient's interview, the patient representative's interview. So we had to develop this uh, methodology together with you, as, as we already explained. Um, and and it was it was really interesting to to get your insight and to to develop this this part of the evaluation process. Um, I, I've heard from Michelle and Barbara about some of the challenges around the HCP evaluation process and they call for, you know, maybe we could improve that and streamline it. I would like to ask you, Paula, Michelle and Barbara each, how would you improve the methodology of the evaluation process? How can we make it a bit lighter without losing its effectiveness? So maybe, uh, Paula, you go first and put you on the spot, if that's OK. okay. Yes. Um, well, I, I know the evaluation is uh, quite long and, and we are asking a lot of documentation for both the ERNs and HCPs. Um, I'm not sure there's uh, an, an easier way to do this. Uh, we're asking for a lot of documentation. Um, this was something that was um, on the table from the beginning, let's say. Um, but I think that maybe we can give some more time to prepare for the next time we can give more time to prepare the, all the documents and, and start preparing it a little bit more in advance. I, I took note on, of everything uh, you have said regarding the, your improvements, so, so your suggestion for improvement. So we will for sure take that into account for the next time. Um, but yeah, I mean, basically more giving a little bit more of, of time to prepare everything because I know it's it's time consuming and there are some other things that are really important and for the HCPs as well, they have to, to be focused on treating patients and uh, this is some additional tasks that we are asking them to do and, and, and it's a lot time consuming. So 
Okay, thank you. Michelle, do you want to try and fill in the gaps? Uh, yes, I, I, well, I would say it's it's all about uh, a key aspect is is com uh, communicating with the healthcare provider. Probably this is best done at chief executive level and really encouraging them to support their clinical teams. So to try and get more accountability from the hospital management that it's their responsibility to help with the general criteria, for example. Um, and this has already been done quite well, as I mentioned, in the hospitals where a very great number of ERNs are included. Um, but a, a, as I mentioned, it's much, much more difficult for that one clinical unit in uh, a hospital um, that's only involved in one ERN. Um, they're the ones that really need the support, because if they're trying to deal with the specific measurable elements, the clinical ones related to the ERN and all the general criteria on top of that, on top of their normal jobs, um, then it really is uh, a very heavy burden. So uh, I, I think clear communication from the commission and the evaluation body right to the very top of the hospital to let them know that it's their responsibility to help with this. Um, and maybe sharing some examples of the sorts of documents that are going to be needed. Um, I think that would help as well. Um, uh, maybe, Barbara, you were part of the original application round. Did all those general criteria evidence, has it changed? Because I'm sure the uh, HCPs had to pull together that information in the beginning. How much of that really had changed over five years? Or, or is it stuff which, you know, the... Um, uh, the the quality improvement system in the in the hospitals change every every year. I mean, I'm just wondering how much it, it was a burden and whether we had that information already. I cannot really give um, a very concise information on that because I do simply not know. But what I can pass on from the project manager who or uh, told us what he, the feedback that he received from individual healthcare providers that sometimes they felt like they had a little bit to reinvent the wheel. For example, they had to um, give information on processes that have already been, uh, they had a quality assurance standard operating procedures on the national level that were up and running oh, and okay. approved and they had to form, you renew this. So I think what they want might not only be a little bit more time but probably a less strict format where you could also um, bring in documents that have been approved and not to make them anew. But um, I do not really know uh, in detail what specifically that could have been because I'm not involved in these processes mm. anymore. It's a really good point, actually, and it's one which I think has been lost. In the original application, um, at, at HCPs could provide evidence which would be used in your national processes for designation. So that was part of the original assessment framework. Um, and that might have been lost in developing the evaluation framework. So maybe we can go back to reiterate that. That's a really good point. Um, I've, I, while, while you're there, Barbara, because I'm, I'm, I think with, with um, Pet cans really fortunate to have CZI as a, you know, as a, a European Federation connecting with all the national patient groups. Um, in the in this process of evaluation of the network so far, it's really looked at trying to understand how patient patient organisations have contributed, and obviously there's a huge benefit and value with how CCI is structured. Can you share maybe how some of that how CCI has been a benefit? within PETCAN so far and how what, what came up in, in the evaluation? So first of all, the cooperation was always there right from the beginning. We have 
parents or relatives from children who have survived or have not survived and they really want to change things they want to improve the situation and we have also influential people who were always working very closely with the healthcare providers because they all want the same thing and it is extremely urgent i think um this is what is the big motivation for us to, 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 to do so many things and to, to unite and to connect so much, probably more than other diseases that are not so life-threatening uh, as in our case. Um, the, apart from that, so we have... Um, we have a community of people who are super active on the European level, also on the international level. But I would also like to speak a little bit about the challenges is which are that uh, our national contact points within the urn pet can they still see some improvement in the cooperation between their national health care provider and the national contact point in some countries because it happens that they do not really know themselves well. Uh, not all healthcare providers in certain countries are aware of the European Reference Network at all. Others do not really know how to get into contact and how to benefit from the system that is already there. And from the uh, national uh, patient organization, it's the same. So there is a little bit of um, a lack of clear pathways how on the on this specific level the interaction could be so that everybody could benefit a bit better so this is a thing that we are currently working on most and it's it's the most pressing pressing thing because the people that I have shown, they are very active. They know each other for years. Mm. They know what they want. But now we have to reach out to those who really need it on the spot. Super. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Charissa, in, in Reconnect, um, you, you should highlight the increase of the patient representatives and how you've been very much in the steering committee. Um, how, how have you really involved all the patient representatives to contribute in that pro in the evaluation process? You've talked about being part of the coordination team meeting, and some were selected for the in in the patient interviews, but not all. So, how how did you work together as a community? Uh, we actually. Uh... Well, the coordination team was very open and uh, through the steering committee as well, uh, they sent all the emails and all the supported documents. And our EPAC also had meetings and we uh, also discussed everything, uh, what we were going to do. And we also had meetings afterwards. So throughout the whole process we were had, we had discussions we talked we looked at the documents and we decided if we agreed with uh, the suggested uh, the three people that were put forward who were the longest if we would all agree uh, then we all read through the documents that the ER and coordination team had, had sent and then uh, the, also during the monthly uh, EPAC meetings, which we conduct completely ourselves without uh, any one from the coordination team there uh, present. Uh, we also just dis discuss everything. So, uh, and discuss the process as well and our concerns. And we take all those concerns uh, that we have discussed in our EPAC group and then the six people that eventually were chosen to, took it all back to the to the uh, eva evaluation interview super so so i i i love hearing when when patient representatives talk about our network you know it's not it's not the network it's not someone else's it's ours so i i love that and i heard that with you charissa and i had the pleasure of being at the reconnect event yesterday but i'm um, how how much maybe Michelle you can uh, say you you you've got a very feisty patient group patient representative group they they don't they're not wallflowers they they're quite they voice their opinion 
in the evaluation process? Did you all agree on where the network was at or was there some difference of opinion? I, I, think, I think generally we all agree that we're going in the right direction, but the, uh, uh, the thing that um, constantly crops up is I think the patient representatives think that we're not going fast enough. Um, so there's always this impetus to, to effect change more quickly. And of course, when you're working with 57 hospitals in 20 countries, um, things can't happen overnight. So I think there is a bit of an in, a sense of impatience really. Um, but they're really, uh, I'll give you one example, but there's, you know, an enormous steps forward can be made. And, and, and this was a piece of work that was actually led by one of our EPAG representatives. Um, so we collaborated with Orphanet uh, to change the coding and the classification for one of our disease areas, anorectal malformations, which was very out of date. It was just low, intermediate and high, the classification used by Orphanet. And so at the initiative of the patient organisations, the EPAG representative, um, a series of meetings with the clinicians was held with Orphanet. And we now have um, a completely different classification system, a much more um, up-to-date one based on more up-to-date medical literature. Um, and many more codes are now available. Um, and that's very important for the patient representatives because in countries, sometimes the reimbursements uh, for specialist services are linked to those orphanet coding. Um, so there's great gains to be made by work, not just working together, but in our case, you know, some of this work has been led by the, and pushed right. by the patient representatives. Um, so I think they want us to go faster. So we just hope that we can keep up with them, <laughs> essentially. <laughs> Uh, so, so Barbara, you know, is that is that your perception as well, or you know, does Pet Can need to put the ped pedal to the floor and you know move to second, third gear? Are you seeing that that increase? And what's your what, what has there been any sort of different difference of opinion in in, in your network? I, I like to be controversial. I like I, I just don't want us all to be sat there and all get on awfully well. Um, you know, being with the evaluators, how how comfortable it is to sort of highlight when you're not happy. So may, maybe is has that been a problem? No, I had to snicker a little bit when Michelle mentioned that their uh, patient representatives want them to move faster because this is exactly <laughs> what our patient representatives also always complained about uh, that things are too slow that things should uh, move faster but um, yes this was perceived and uh, recognized by the coordinator which is why I'm actually here now because they saw that things uh, some things could be improved some things could be moved in a better way and um, you know it's it's like uh, yeah playing the ball to to the one and back to the other so and and everybody said if you would do this then we could and uh, so in in the end everybody agreed that both have to become more active not only the healthcare providers and the patients waiting for them to uh, bring some results but also on the other way around um, that if the patient representatives become active if they initiate things if they yeah bring things into life that they want uh, together with the healthcare providers then uh, uh, it could also work out and um, yeah um, we should a, a little bit uh, move away from the position that we are sitting there and waiting for better results, but standing up and bringing also the results from our side. This is, um, I think this is key. Uh, if both do stuff, if both are active, then things can be achieved. So, 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 so it's a bit of understanding that it's, it is our network and therefore we, we can move things forward and being a bit more, um, uh, uh, not autonomous, but a bit more um, independent in pushing things forward. 
Yeah, but also understanding yourself as an expert as well. So, and not being in the position that the healthcare provider shows us how things should be done. They know it and we are the patients, we are receiver, we are receivers, but this should not be the case anymore. And we should move away from this role as a receiving part of the network, but also of an active uh, part of the network. I think this is also very important, this, this mindset change a little bit. Uh, uh, Charissa, is that mindset changed in, in Reconnect? I, I, I just remember Absolutely. Iliara was the first one up yesterday on the mic. Yes. <laughs> I think she kept uh, the mic. <laughs> well, uh, we, we're very verbal, like, as we, as I mentioned before, uh, we continuously, we're now with four people, uh, four EPAC advocates in the steering committee, and we continually, cont continuously bring uh, critical or constructive criticism up in the steering committee uh, that we bring from the EPAC uh, meetings with us, and they do listen. Uh, we also, in the evaluation meetings, we also brought up constructive criticism, and uh, we also mentioned that the ERN is actually has taken action on it. So uh, right. we, we still have to see the change happening, and actually the EPAC itself is also taking action. Should the ERN not, not have taken action, we have started our own working groups to take our own action. So. Uh, as ERN says, we are the driving force, so we, we try in our own way, uh, try to see, uh, make, help make things happen a little bit faster and try to take things in our own hands. And that has helped in the past. And we have found a, a very positive way of working together. And it, it works in our ERN that way. So. Super. It, I, I, I just remember we, we, I did a bit yesterday in the presentation about um, principles of uh, patient uh, partnership in the networks and um, that sense of responsiveness by the clinicians to, you know that when you give feedback that they act on it and um, so I, I think that's a new framework which uh, Innis and Lenya and Rita are developing with with the patient representatives in Reconnect and other networks I think it really helps to sort of move us to being more proactive in, in taking the lead as well uh, which I think we touched upon I'm conscious of time I've got one last question if you can indulge me to to Paula um I think you've had a massive job on your hands I mean it, just managing 24 network coordinators managing one network coordinator is a lot <laughs> which I'm sure uh, uh Michelle and Barbara and, and Teresa can can identify with but you've also had the evaluations of 900 HCPs um, that must have come with some challenges uh, in a very short period of time can you maybe just highlight one or two of the key challenges you've faced and how you've overcome them sure um, I mean one of the most uh, important challenge I think it was to coordinate the agendas of the HCPs uh, as well as the evaluators so uh, for not all of the ATPs, but for 193 ATPs, we had uh, on-site audits. So there, we needed to have two evaluators uh, going to these um, ATPs to, to do the on-site audit for one day. So it was kind of um, difficult to coordinate all the agendas to do this uh, because we also had a really tight schedule. So we had to have all the on-site audits in two months. Um, and it's it was Easter holidays in in between and winter holidays in some countries, so it's it was kind of uh, stressful. But it it turned out okay for now. Uh, it's currently being um, contacted all the onsite audits, but for now we haven't had any problem. And another big challenge, um, I think it was to, um, as I mentioned in the onsite audits. There's one part that it's uh, the medical records review. And then we have another part that it's interview with patients. And some HCPs uh, were kind of reluctant to have interviews with patients and to let us see the medical records review, not because of their, um, let's say, internal um, 
things in the hospital, but because of the different national laws. So in some EU countries, it's not possible to, to show the medical records without the patient consent. And it was kind of, of complicated to, to get this, but we also overcome this, this challenge. So thank you very much. With three minutes over, I just want to say thank you to Ines for uh, opening the, the webinar, uh, to Paula for your uh, for IDOM's support and engagement with our community to ensure that patient representatives can really meaningfully contribute to this process. And you've really reflected that uh, in, in the support you've done. Michelle, Barbara and Charissa, thank you for being brave and sharing your experiences of the evaluation process. Um, I, I'm, we're waiting with bated breath on the outcome of the process and seeing how we can really use this to strengthen the networks and to improve them in the areas we do. So I think that's it for today. Um, thank you very much to everyone for uh, joining in. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.